PowerPoint, right? Yep. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, our ladies NYC for organizing this series. I am very delighted to have the opportunity to present this work. As a biostatistician, I collaborate with several researchers from the public health discipline as well as the biomedical discipline. I joined Rutgers University two years ago, and I work with graduate students from the School of Public Health at Rutgers, in addition to collaborating with colleagues from the cancer, um, Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Data visualization approaches allow me to communicate data as well as results with students as well as my experienced collaborators more effectively than using tables. And visuals such as the one that you see on this slide have um, emerged over numerous discussions in an iterative manner. And taking my collaborators and my students through this iterative journey has helped me to better highlight the results as well as the critical role of data visualization in numerous studies that we collaborate on. In the next few slides, I will show some steps that I took to arrive at the plot that you see on the screen. Recently, I was studying breast cancer in South Asian women and non-Hispanic women living in the United States using data from the National Cancer Institute's SEER Cancer Registry. We wanted to examine the characteristics of breast cancer in South Asian women versus non-Hispanic white women, characteristics such as age at diagnosis, tumor stage, and so on. So to look at the age at diagnosis, we initially looked at the histograms of age at diagnosis in the two populations, as we see in the slide. And adding different colors provide better visuals. So I use colors from Color Brewer uh, to identify useful colors for these plots. We learned about Color Brewer in one of the Our Ladies talks earlier this summer. I could have easily shown the colored histogram as the first, um, at the first iteration to my team but showing the gray shaded histogram and then the colored histogram allowed them to appreciate the incremental yet critical benefits of using colors in the histogram to distinguish between the distribution of age at diagnosis in the two populations. But all said and done, these are two distinct histograms. So overlaying the two histograms for better visual comparison uh, allowed me to um, help them see that uh, uh, South Asians have younger age at diagnosis than the non-Hispanic white uh, women because the blue histogram is poking out a little bit towards the left compared to the red histogram for the non-Hispanic white population. An overlay of this histogram can be done very easily using R. In base R, we can use the add option, as well as in ggplot, we can use the fill option to get this. But what is happening here is the red plot is sitting very much on top of the blue plot, not allowing us to appreciate much of what is happening in the blue histogram, which is the age and diagnosis distribution of South Asian women. This can be addressed by making the colors transparent using the alpha parameter in the RGB coloring scheme. And that is what I used uh, but with alpha equal to 0 0.75 to get this. So now we can see what is happening to the distribution of age at diagnosis for both populations. Now, when I wanted to look at the distribution of disease stage, Pie charts are one useful way of doing this. Disease stage is a categorical variable. It takes values localized stage, regional stage, or distant stage disease. And using a default coloring scheme in the pie chart for in R, we can readily see that South Asian women have fewer localized disease than non-Hispanic white cases 
because the blue part for South Asian women is less considerably than the non it is for non-Hispanic white women. Now, Color Brewer offers better choices of colors and colors that can be more friendly to a wider audience that are uh, that can see colors differently from others. So I was able to use Color Brewer once again to get better um, histogram, I'm sorry, pie charts. Now I have a distribution of age as well as distribution of disease stage. I can position them side by side to convey that South Asian women have younger age at diagnosis of breast cancer, and they also have fewer localized disease um, than non-Hispanic white women. So these are characteristics pointing to seemingly aggressive disease in South Asian population compared to non-Hispanic white women. And this plot allows me to communicate that. But a more effective plot can be obtained by positioning all of them together, especially by putting the pie charts as insets into the histogram. This can be achieved using the floating.py function in the Plotly library. And we learned about the, this library recently in August during Di Cook's workshop on data visualization. So in summary, visuals offer powerful tools for communicating very critical aspects of data and arriving at useful figure is an iterative process. R offers numerous data visual opportunities and it is a journey that we have to travel in an iterative manner. Data visualization is both a science as well as an art, science in terms of the scientific aspects that we try to do as well as the types of functions that we try to use. And for the art side of R, I like to use the R graph gallery, which offers numerous ideas and some very cool plots along with R codes. This is all I have to share with you today. And thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you, Jaya. Um, that was an excellent step-by-step -step on progressively using colors and insets in data viz to tell a story. Um, so taking Jaya's cue and using pie charts, we're gonna continue the conversation with Rachel's talk on pie charts titled Friend or Foe. Take it away, Rachel. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so, hi, my name is Rachel. I'm a recent MPH graduate from Columbia University. And today I wanted to talk about pie charts. And I feel like the previous presentation was a great, um, great segue because I think that um, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about, about pie charts is because they are so frequently used and so frequently requested uh, and can be so effective as we saw in the previous presentation. Um, but I also feel like I hear a lot of criticisms of pie charts and that you know sometimes they're not the best data visualization for the part to whole relationship. And I wanted to just collate some of my thoughts about that and also hopefully introduce some of you to the waffle function within the waffle package, which is uh, a really easy, simple um, alternative to pie charts. So um, why do we use pie charts? So one obvious answer is memes. <laughs> um, but I think the other thing that this pie chart really gets apart across is that they're really intuitive conceptually. And for that reason, they're some of the first data visualizations that most people learn. I think I probably learned about pie charts in grade school. And so they're really accessible for that reason. And for that reason, it's not surprising that they come up so often. That being said, there are some pitfalls to pie charts that can come up. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of them now. So the first problem that can come up is too many slices. So you have a part to whole relationship and you just have way too many parts and it's really difficult to actually differentiate between those slices and figure out, okay, which of these is the most, um, are, are these two slices different from each other? Is one larger than the other? This particular pie chart is an example of that. It's from totally made up data that I made for the purposes of the, this presentation. And in my opinion, one way to manage this 
um, is just to convert it into a simple bar chart, um, which is a little more manageable. You see um, all of the, your parts in one, um, just in your Y axis, and it's sort of designed to, to handle more levels. Um, and that way you also can more easily see the difference between say A and B here, that B is smaller than A. Um, and so that's one, one way to handle it. That being said, you lose a little bit that, of that sort of intuitive feeling of you have a part to whole relationship. Um, and so going on to problem two, which is that sometimes it can be hard to differentiate between the slices of a pie, even if you have seemingly a manageable number of, of levels. And so this pie chart is a pie chart that I made for um, some research that I did as, as part of my MPH, um, which I presented um, in August. And so I was trying to figure out how I wanted to present it. And I can go into that in a little more detail if anyone is interested, you can just ask me directly, but I won't go into it now um, for the sake of time. And what you can see here is that we have slices that are sort of similar in size, but they're clearly different. So this light green one is traffic and road dust versus the purple one, which is uh, crustal dust and the darker green one, which is nitrate. And those are all different from each other. And I know that the uh, traffic and road dust is 5% larger than the crustal dust, which is 5% larger than the um, nitrate part. But it's hard to tell exactly sort of how, how much larger it is. And so I think this is a really good usage of the waffle chart, which is what I ended up doing for my presentation. Um, and so you still maintain this part of whole relationship idea. And you still have this feeling that, OK, this teal color, that's making up half, pretty much. Um, but you also have this extra element, which is splitting up your whole into unit parts in term in these squares and the squares um in this case are about two percent um but it can vary depending on how you choose to choose to organize it um and so here i think it's a little easier to differentiate between these parts the the light green versus the purple versus the darker green um and if you were really in doubt you could just count the squares and it wouldn't take that long to do um so that being said, there are a couple of drawbacks, one being that you still have some issues with rounding. Um, so for example, these smaller parts, industrial and salt, which is blue and yellow on the end, they both look like they're the same in the, in the waffle chart, but in fact, um, the blue one is larger. It's almost 2%, where it, whereas the yellow one is 1.5%. Um, so just to go quickly into um, how to make a waffle chart, it's very simple. It uses the waffle package. And basically it takes a named vector. So I created this vector called vowels and then I uh, created a, another vector, vowel names, and I uh, created a named vector. And then I just put that right into the waffle package, the waffle function within the waffle package. Um, and I specified the number of rows. So that basically tells you, you know, you're gonna have your, your waffle chart is gonna be six rows tall. Um, and that can also help you to figure out, do, you, do I want a square waffle or do I want a rectangular one? In this case, I chose, chose rectangular, but I think a lot of the time people will choose square. Um, and then I specified the colors as well in the, the third line here. Um, and there are several other specifications that you can make that are available in the waffle documentation that you can check out. Um, but just to really quickly show how you make a waffle chart, um, I think that it's a really useful visualization. It's also um, just pretty accessible. Um, so are pie charts ever the answer? And I think the reason why I framed it this way is because I found that there are a lot of people who have really strong opinions about pie charts. Uh, many people who have very strong opinions against pie charts, including this uh, quote directly from the waffle package documentation, which I'm not going to read out, but it's very sassy. Um, and <laughs> um, so my personal opinion is that yes, sometimes pie charts really are the answer because they are really intuitive. And if you have a clear message that you can put across using your pie chart, I think they can be really effective. 
But it's also important to keep in mind what the drawbacks are and if there are alternatives that might actually be uh, preferable for achieving your data visualization goals. So that's all that I have. Um, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and this is my email address. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. I love this thorough explanation of pie charts and your introduction of waffle charts. And I'm now very hungry. I'm going to hand it over to Yolanda, who's going to present their talk, uh, Surviving COVID-19 After Hospital Discharge, Symptom, Functional, and Adverse Outcomes of Home Health Recipients. Take it away, Yolanda. Hi, thank you. Let me just share my screen. OK, screen. So do you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, okay, great, thank you. Okay, so um, this is my second LinkedIn talk. Thank you very much for um, just me to participate. And uh, um, just um, this is, uh, let me see. Ah, it's not going anywhere. No, I need to me for a second, okay. Now, what about now? Yes. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So this is um, the results. These are the results of a um, study that we published in the Annals of Internal Medicine about the experience of what happened to patients that were discharged to the hospital from the hospital to what is called home care, home health care. So people can be discharged from the hospital to uh, what we call the community, or they can receive some care that were clinicians, being nurses or physical therapists, go to their house and they help them with uh, things that they need to do. It's also the story. So it's the story of what happened to them, people that we saw in, uh, in the, at the City Nurse Service of New York, which is where I work. And also the story of somebody that is a group, basically, that was basically a SaaS shop and switch. I switched it, <laughs> at least, you know, for this, this uh, study to at least most of it to be our um, work doing the, the analysis in R. So um, the background is like, we know, you know, we know that the, in March 1st, 2020, the New York State reported the first COVID-19 case and 94% of the people in the New York City area were discharged home with or without home health care. So after leaving the hospital. Um, and nationwide, only 11% of those sort of people, COVID-19 survivors that were discharged from the hospital, receive home health care. So um, this study is the retrospect is a retrospective observational cohort of 1409 confirmed COVID-19 patients admitting to VNS and Y. And uh, so people were um, referred from 64 hospitals in the New York City area and admitted to home health care between April 1st and June uh, 15. And they either were this until we follow them until where they were either discharged from home health care, re-hospitalized, they died, or uh, after September 15, um, they were still in home health care. So as I mentioned, uh, home health care is um, service that uh, provides skilled nursing, physical and occupational therapy to people discharged from the hospital, or also they can come from the community. But in this example, everybody came from the hospital. Uh, episodes of care last 60 days. And uh, in general, on any given day, a year, sorry, 3.4 million people use, use home health care. Um, the outcomes that we were interested in were the service use, the number and types of home health care visits that the patients receive, uh, changes between the home health care start of care, so the beginning of the episode, and discharge on these five uh, different um, uh, indicators of uh, disease. And the adverse events that we looked at were um, rehospitalization and death. And the statistical analysis here, you can see how, you know, there was this switch a little bit uh, from still doing things, not everything in R, but uh, where whatever was available. But so a lot of the data manipulation, so that they put in the data together, uh, like Sophie was 
mentioning was use, uh, done using SQL, SAS, SQL, or the data step, depending. Um, some of the um, analysis was, uh, sorry, the, the data manipulations, with like the creation of the LX Hauster comorbidity um, calculations were used in R using the comorbidity, and that was my lagging talk last year. Uh, and the, the data labeling was used uh, HMEs, uh, and uh, some other tests were done in SAS, um, but used like different packages in, in R to like read the data using Haven, compare groups, et cetera, et cetera, and doing survival and using the GG Forest uh, uh, um, package to, to do certain plots. And then some states, uh, I use even Stata to do some negative binomial uh, calculations. So um, the results uh, that, I that I'm gonna show between this uh, April 1st and June 15, we, these were the patients that we saw. What I, I, I'm not gonna go over all the results because I don't have time, but the, what is important to see here that you probably wouldn't know because you don't know home care is that people were much younger than we usually see in home care. In home care, we usually see people that are covered by Medicare and usually they are 65 and older and usually they are very old. So here they, we had a group 43% of people that were um, under 65. And no, these are not GG plots. So we'll talk about that later. Uh, most of them were male, which in general, the other way around. Usually we see mostly female, and this is the distribution by race. And we have like a more than a quarter that was their payer was other than Medicare or Medicaid, which, which is usually un. We don't, we don't see that. Um, so people were really sick at the, at the beginning. They have many came back, came with hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. And uh, as were the risk factors from COVID that we know of right now, as, uh, as, uh, um, as we know. So what the outcomes, uh, what happened uh, with the outcomes? So, 94% of the people that we saw were discharged from home health care. So in some way, they, it was them that they recovered. Um, 137 or 9.7% were rehospitalized, 11 died, and there were 23 at the end of the follow-up that were still seen in home care. Um, what is interesting to see were the differences between the beginning of home care and the end of home care. Uh, people were reporting much less pain. Um, they didn't have, they were reporting no dyspnea. Dyspnea is shortness of breath, as we know in COVID, that's a problem. And 73 at the end, when they were discharged, reported no more shortness of breath. Uh, they were also cognitively more alert. Uh, they reported less anxiety and the number of ADLs and IDLs, the activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living, uh, they were dependent only on one compared to six when they came to home care. And here are the risk factors of the adverse events. So adverse events, we combine rehospitalizations or death. And uh, as we know, they were more likely to be male, non-Hispanic white race, and this is uh, explained because they were um, um, older. The white group was older, congestive heart failure, diabetes, etc. So they had like what we expect them to have as risk factors of uh, adverse event. So I want to just mention, as to, to finish, that this uh, was actually not a GG plot. Uh, uh, or an R plot, and this would be the GG Forest plot. And I they couldn't find for the publication a way to make it so that I could edit the labels in the plot. So, well, so I had to basically improvise. Um, so if you know of any plot that does this in R, let me know. If not, maybe next thing would be to try to write a function that does it. And uh, so the only thing that I want to mention is that the limitations of this, that we were unable to compare these people that were discharged to home health care that have like pretty good outcomes all in all 
to those that did not receive home care. So we don't know what happened to them. And uh, most likely we received the people that obviously were discharged the hospital because they didn't die in the hospital. So it looks like they did really well, but you know, um, I'm sure there were a bunch of people that we needed, didn't get because unfortunately we did, right? So, and um, so um, this was just basically a great boost for the people that were giving care to these patients because we were able to show them a bunch of nurses and physical therapists that what they did actually made a difference. And uh, there were some recommendations of what kind of data we would like to have if we were to do this again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yolanda. Being able to navigate between SAS, R, and SATA to do analyses for the same project is like a superpower. That's fantastic. Well done. <laughs> Um, all right, so now we're going to go to something a little different. Um, we're going to talk about another facet of R that's near and dear to my heart. So Melissa is going to talk to us about R Merkdown, otherwise known as male merge on steroids. Take it away, Melissa. Thank you. All right, can you see my screen now? Yep. OK, great. Um, yeah, so my name is Melissa Albino Hegeman, and I am a marine biologist for the state of New York. Um, so that also means I'm a government bureaucrat who writes a lot of reports. And I've been using R for most of my analysis for the past few years. And then I started seeing really cool R Markdown talks from other um, people, like at R Ladies and some other groups. And it seemed like a really great solution uh, to some of my, my reporting problems. Right. So as I said, I produce a lot of reports. I mean, in the busiest months, I could be updating like thousands of reports a week. Because if it's not in a report, you haven't done anything, is generally how my office works. But, you know, I've only been able to accomplish that level of reporting through our markdown. When things are easier, you tend to be able to do them more. So we went also from very basic summary reports to much more in-depth um, individualized reports for each, each of our stakeholders uh, due to our markdown. And once my, my bosses saw like the extra, the added value of this, like then you can't go back, unfortunately. And you also tend to do them more often. You make more reports and you do them more often when they're easier. So I many of my reports, I would only update quarterly or annually. And now with our markdown, I can update them on a weekly or even daily schedule if that's what everybody in my office needs for a certain project. So why our markdown? I was already using R, so it makes sense to keep, keep everything in that same workflow. I used to have to export from R, go to Excel and Word to do mail merges um, to make these reports. And something would always go wrong, like with a date in Excel, I accidentally sent out a letter that had a due date of January of 2015 for some people, just because Excel did math on a date. Um, so I don't have any of those problems in R. So it's simplified the process, it's kept it all together. I can send it to Word, I can send it to a PDF, I can send it to an HTML, which non-tech people really love, I found. They think it's very cool when they can open that HTML and like filter in it, and they think it's very fancy. Um, and all this code, of course, is reusable too, which allows me to, to put more and more reports out there to answer people's questions. So all of my projects tend to be divided into two parts, the analysis part that's all in the R code and then the reporting um, parts that are in R markdown. And it's this little piece of code that has changed my life. It's just a simple for loop that allows me to cycle through all of the data sets that I've put together and customize them. Um, I only have one variable in this example, like the subject, but you could pull like an individual's name, their permit numbers, all sorts of specific information from those data sets that I've already created and push them to an R markdown file. Um, and do that, you know, 
hundreds of times over. Uh, today, I, I just updated some of our compliance reports and letters that go out, and that's 1,600 um, reports that I have to make that I was able to do in 20 minutes, which is you know, much, much faster than my previous uh, Excel mail merge situation, and I can update it much more frequently. Um, and yeah, so this is this little snippet, which I think I saw on um, now that now that I've started Googling R Markdown, like YouTube just serves me all the R Markdown videos you could ever want. Um, so this this little bit I found while Googling, and while it's very slow, and I'm sure there's a faster way to do it, um, it's kind of you know tipped me over the edge. So never going back to the Excel and word mail merge again. And that's all. You can find me on Twitter, although I'm not very good at Twitter. And there's my email. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Markdown files are definitely a great way to avoid Excel thinking that something is a date for sure. Sometimes, though, Excel can do something cool um, that is hard to translate into R. Um, so for our next talk, um, we're going to hand it over to Alejandra, who's going to talk about how to do VLOOKUP in R. All right, then. Um, hi, I'm Alejandra. I use she, her pronouns. I am a marketer and a fundraiser. And today I'll share how to do VLOOKUP in R. So let's start with what is VLOOKUP. Uh, VLOOKUP is a commonly used Excel formula. And, in, and for many people, one of the first powerful things we learn to do with data. It is helpful when you want to bring to your table information that can be found by looking at the right record in some other table. For example, let's say that I'm rewatching The Office and every time I watched an episode, I record the date I watched it, the season and the episode number and how much I liked it. And to this table, I'd like to add the title and the original air date of each episode, both of which I can find in this other data set, which I got from the Tidy Tuesday uh, GitHub repository, and which has that and some other information for all episodes of The Office. So in Excel, what I would do is first, I would add to both of these tables a column with the season and episode number, because for this formula, I'm going to need all the identifying information to be in one column. And then I use the formula, which takes as input the value to look for, the table to look in, and what column of that table I want to bring in. And with that, I get the result I want, which is the original table I had, plus uh, columns for the title and air date of each episode. So how do I do this in R? Well, in R, those two tables would be the tables shown here, which I've named my ratings for the table and building, and office ratings for the information that I got from the Tidy Tuesday table. So how do you do a VLOOKUP? Well, it turns out there's a package for that. So you can use a Tidy Quant package, which has a function called VLOOKUP, which corresponds almost exactly to the Excel formula and has documentation that is very easy to follow if you're used to the Excel version of doing this. So again, I'll create a season and episode variable. And then I use mutate and I call the VLOOKUP formula for each column that I want to add. And voila, I have my results. And this could be a very short talk. But I don't want to stop here. Because what is VLOOKUP, really? Let's review again the problem I was trying to solve. I have two tables. And I want to bring to the first table information from the second table. This, my friends, is a join which means that I can use the deployer join functions to solve my problem. In this case, I'm going to use a left join. So I use left join, I get the information I want, but I only really wanted the title and air date functions. So I, I let a select to remove the columns I don't need, and I get the result I wanted, my original, col my original table with the two added columns that I wanted. Now, let me share with you why I found that for my uses of VLOOKUP, using joins often ends up being a better solution than the VLOOKUP function. First, if your identifying information is in more than one column, the player can handle that. And you don't need to create an ID column like I had to do earlier with the season and episode variable. Second, often when I'm using VLOOKUP, I want to bring in more than one column, which with the VLOOKUP function involves a lot of copy pasting. But by using the player joins, I can avoid all of that. 
And third and most important, once you start looking at VLOOKUPs as joins, you find that different specific join functions can get you what you need faster. For example, often I use VLOOKUP to find which records of one table exist in the other as a first step to filter or count. If that's what I want to do with deep layer joins, I can use a semi-join or, ant or an anti-join, and I will get a more direct way to get exactly what I need. Finally, I also want to mention an obstacle that you can run into when you're first making the switch if you're used to using VLOOKUPs and you want to use join functions. Sometimes the data you have isn't immediately ready for the join you need. For example, what if instead of the office ratings data, I only have access to this other data set, this amazing data frame, which, which is from the Shrewd package, which contains the entire transcript of all episodes of the office, and also has the information I'm looking for, the title and the air date of each episode. So let's try what I did earlier. I do a left join, and instead of the small table I was expecting, I got hundreds of rows and 14 columns. So what happened? Well, two things happened. One, the shoot data set has many, many, many more columns that I need. And two, in the uh, shoot data set, the same episode appears in the, data set, in the data frame more than once. So the left join is adding columns to my table, even though the information in those rows is not relevant to what I need. So how do I solve this? Well, I can take that shoot data set and create from that the right table for my join. So in this case, I'm going to use a select uh, to take the columns I need and a distinct to remove the duplicates. And now I can do the left join and I get the exact results I needed. So in conclusion, if you really, really want to replicate the VLOOKUP function as close as, as the Excel version as possible, you can use the VLOOKUP function from the tidyquant package. However, if you're like me, you might find that deployer, jo deployer joins are often a better solution for the problem you're trying to solve. And finally, when using joins, if the table that has the variables you want has a lot more information than you need, first create the table you need for the join, and then the join. And that's it. Now you know how to do VLOOKUP scenario. Thank you. Thanks, Alejandra. This is a great discussion of VLOOKUP and joins. So I'll keep this in mind for the next time I'm talking to my colleagues who use Excel and are talking about how awesome VLOOKUP is. Um, all right, so for our next talk, um, we're gonna look at plotting movement data in R with Anika. All right, can you guys see my screen without the presenter view? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, yes, my name is Annika. I am trained as an ecologist, but generally identify as a data enthusiast. Um, now I work at a small company that harnesses environmental data to understand risk. Um, but here I'm gonna show you a neat package that I have been enjoying using to visualize movement data. So this package is called ggmap and it's cool because it builds on top of the ggplot um, structure which many of us know and love. And so you can produce quick visualizations of spatial data but it layers on top of this um, static maps from these sources here from Google Maps, OpenStreetMap, Stamen Maps, and CloudMade Maps. Um, and so we can make these uh, visualizations that look really nice um, map-wise, but also use the familiar ggplot grammar. Um, and so I wrote up the code for this on a little blog post if you want to um, look at it sometime in the future. It's here, um, but we're going to be using this caribou data. So movement data is all over the place these days. We have GPS data, we have animal movement data, um, all kinds of it. And so here um, you can just see a little glimpse of the data frame. And some of the variables that we're going to be using are the location data, so the latitude and longitude the tag identifier, which is basically an identifier for each caribou, um, each individual. And then there's day of year and uh, the year that the observation was made. And so um, most of this is collared data. So it's caribou that um, are wearing collars and then 
um, their locations will be recorded periodically. Okay, so the first step in doing these visualizations is just to prepare the background map. So we load ggplot, we load ggmap, and then we make a bounding box um, using the latitude and longitude uh, just to show the extent of the region that we're interested in mapping. And then you can use the get map function to ingest that bounding box. And you can just define the map type that you want here. So I'm going to use a Google satellite map, but you can use some very um, pretty maps that are a bit more stylized or watercolor style maps um, to make other visualizations. In general, the structure will always be GG map of that map object we just made. And then over top of that, we can add a geom path, which will allow us to actually um, overlay that path from the movement data on top of the map. So here's an example where we color um, by day of year to look at if there's any seasonal migration pattern. Um, and so you can notice that the color scale is updated to include the ends of the year. Um, and so we can just see at a quick glance where the caribou were at different times of the year. And then we can also look here, we color by individual tag number to see where different caribou reside. And you can see that it looks like there's a few clusters of individuals here. Um, certain colors tend to move around to certain areas. And so very quickly, um, we can understand a little bit about what's going on with this herd of caribou, that there are certain individuals hanging out um, in certain areas. And so if we look at the code for this one, you can see um, it follows that same structure with ggmap, we call that map object, and then over top of that, uh, called a geom path that took the lat long data and then colored it by the identifier, which was that individual. And then the third one that I'm showing here is movement over time. So where were these caribou um, over the course of several years that they were recorded? And you can see, um, I found this really interesting that um, the caribou looks like they tend to be moving north here. The older dates closer to the, um, the early 1990s are down in the south. And then the more recent dates in the reds up at 2009 um, are further north. And so over time, this herd has kind of moved northward. And so good visualization can give you these insights really quickly. Um, we have this beautiful, satellite map in the background from Google. Um, and so it's just a really quick way to plot um, movement data. There's a lot that you can do with ggmap. And so what I'm showing here just dips the surface. Um, one of my favorite R bloggers, Little Miss Data, has a great tutorial that goes through it. And there's also everyone's favorite, a cheat sheet um, to go through it as well from NCs. So thanks for listening. I hope you learned something new. I am really grateful to get to present in front of such a great group of women. So thanks for listening. Thanks, Annika. I love seeing how to plot maps in R. They can get super complex and I love seeing how differently they can turn out. That was great, thank you. All right, and here to close us out is Rebecca, who's going to be talking about using RStudio and RStudio Connect. Um, all right, Rebecca, take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see here. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK, cool. I just requested access for the video. Hopefully that works. Um, thank you for having me. It's just been such a lovely set of speakers, and I'm honored to speak alongside of you all. So um, I'm going to be talking about this workflow for a project that I've been tipping away at for a few months. Um, so it'll be quick and gloss over a lot of stuff. Happy to talk about anything um, later. So uh, I work at Vibrant Emotional Health, and we provide a variety of mental health services, um, the main one of which being uh, the one that I work primarily on, which is the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, and we get most of our funding from the federal government. And so that means that we're 
using our relationship with the communications team to leverage what we learn from our data. So we need the communication team to bring us money and the communication team needs us to give them data. And so the cycle continues. And this was one of the first things that I noticed when I joined um, a couple of years ago, that there are these large stakeholder meetings that are kind of can be impromptu and we needed accurate and up-to-date information for them. Um, and we wanted this information to be mutually adjustable. So we wanted the data team to be able to tweak and update um, and also have the communications team be able to adjust the wording, et cetera. Um, and to do all of that without these kind of bulky manual processes, because, you know, AKA Slack um, and just random messages in the middle of the day. So um, to meet these needs, I developed this workflow, um, which takes us from this core um, piece in Google Drive, so this Google Sheet where the communications team can be adjusting um, its talking points, right? So all of the things that they would want to talk about, um, they can change the wording and the structure of it, and then bring this into our um, data ecosystem. So we have the beaver on high is the data warehouse that we use dBeaver, rains down into this R Studio ecosystem. Um, so I have a, an R markdown, a couple of R scripts, and then generate a shiny app. Um, so that all goes into R Studio Connect and we all get to use it. Yay. So I'm going to go a little bit into each of these pieces um, so you can get a sense of how they work together. So first of all, this is the um, talking points uh, Google Sheet that the communications team primarily utilizes. And we can zoom in here and see um, this was a structure that I suggested that would be effective within a data structure. So we have a section, a subsection, and these indentations because they're um, they're kind of linked talking points. So like a broad point and then these specific details that we want to have a relationship with each other and kind of always show up when the other one shows up. Um, so they, they can update this at any point. Um, and then this goes into the R Studio piece. So um, I created a pin which if anybody doesn't know what pins are in R, so helpful. Um, they're basically like uh, a, a really good way to store information um, remotely, uh, kind of like in a cloud-based service. And so I created an R script to read from the Google Sheet and store and format that information however I wanted to use it. Um, and then I created these volume tables that we're pulling directly from our warehouse. Um, and so there are these two different pins that allow this information to be dynamic. Uh, created a user-friendly shiny application interface. Um, and then I, we ended up wanting to include an, an infographic in the talking points document that gets output. Um, so could include additional, it's, it's in a PDF form, but can add others. Um, and then this R markdown to kind of knit everything together, all of the information that we got from the shiny app um, and then output it as a Word document. So this is our studio, how I'm, I'm touching everything. And then we have the Google Sheets and the data warehouse, and then it all goes out through our studio Connect. Um, so Connect is helping all over the place, but um, first these pins that I created, uh, Connect allows me to schedule these scripts to run. So I refresh the talking points every week and then the volume tables are monthly. Um, it hosts the Shiny application and it also hosts the additional documents that I um, am including in the output document. And then it knits it and it downloads the customized Word document. Whenever the user's ready, they can put it into their folder. So this is what the application looks like in Connect. Um, we've got the talking points and then these sections over on the left are all the different sections. Um, just a note on the right, you can change the access to the application. So that's how all of the communications department is able to access it. So if you click on one of these, say about the lifeline, this um, list comes down. And so you can select each individually or you can select or deselect all. This ended up being a lot more time than I thought it would be to make. Um, happy to share code if anybody is in the same rabbit hole. And then this allows the user to review what they've chosen. So you click it here and then you can see, okay, the section, subsection and talking points with that F and S, which stands for first and second, um, showing the relationship between the talking points. And then they click download report. And when they download the report, let's see if we can watch this. 
hey, this is what it looks like. So um, the magic of our markdown truly is in this Word document, I was able to put the, you know, the vibrant branding and then to customize the um, formatting of the outline of this. So this F, the first is, you know, this first bullet point, the S is the second. Um, and so these are all organized in a way that the communications team can grab it and go, um, equipped with the title. Um, and then these are the tables and the infographic. Um, and then the title of the document up at the top here has the date that the document was generated. Um, and this has been a really successful way for us to interface with our communications department. So I hope you've enjoyed um, my talk. You can feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I put my Instagram, why not? It's not really data related, but feel free to get in touch either on my email or on my Instagram. Uh, thank you all so much. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, that was a great introduction to RStudio Connect. Um, you've built this like really complex infrastructure to collaborate with other people at Vibrant and that's really, collaboration is super hard. So that's fantastic, thank you. Um, all right, so that concludes all of our talks. Um, so now we have some time for questions. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure if there have been any questions that have been posted to the chat that we can go over. Um, but if you have questions now, feel free to, um, to just paste them into the chat um, and our speakers can uh, answer your questions. Um, Daya asked how I, how did I get the infographics in the document? Um, it is, uh, it's a PDF and in the, our markdown code, not in a chunk. So outside of a chunk, um, you can just reference a file that's in the folder. So it's just like a PDF. Um, I can grab the code actually and just put it in the chat, but it's, it's actually because it's parameterized. I have like an if statement around it, um, but it just throws it in and it like sizes it. Um, I did not convince them. Uh, I wish I had the foresight, but my supervisor is like a big um, Connect fan and just like a big R fan. Um, so it, he's been convincing the rest of the organization to get on board. And so we're trying to like move away from Tableau um, and more into the shiny universe. Um, Anika, to answer your question, I started learning are shiny when I was on the job. So it's in a lot of like in the, you know, in the water hose. Um, but I can, I can see if I have any resources to share. All right. Um, it looks like we don't have many more questions left in the chat. Um, any last minute ones that people want to throw in there? Otherwise we can, call this another successful Our Ladies Lightning Talk event. Thank you so much to our presenters. Um, this was fantastic. I really enjoy, I love the breadth of topics for the Lightning Talks um, and this was no exception. So thank you everybody for submitting the proposals and presenting. Um, this was so much fun, thanks. <laughs>